You may be seated. Well, in the spirit of our gathering here, boil up some Mountain Dew, everybody. It's going to be a long afternoon. Thank you so much for being here, and welcome to Stoneware Community Church, as well as on behalf of Johnny and, his, and Kim and Wendy and the extended family. We are grateful that you are here. We are grateful that you are present to celebrate and honor Johnny's life. Today we are united both in our grief, but also in the hope that comes from remembering our love for Johnny, his love for you, and also God's love for him. Over these next few minutes, I would like to invite all of you to enjoy the stories that we'll be sharing, to allow the songs that the family has chosen to bless your hearts and to be encouraged as well through the hope of God and his love and the grace that he brings in his unique way through his son. So I ask, will you please join me in a word of prayer as we begin this time together? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you humble today. We are grateful for your presence and we seek your comfort as we mourn and celebrate Johnny. Thank you for the beautiful life that he lived and for the love that he shared with everyone present. May these moments together, may the words shared and the stories named as well honor him as he such deserves. We thank you that we can gather to do so. And we thank you and ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, my name is David Ake, and I am one of our pastors here at Stonebriar Community Church and a long friend of the Degenis family. And uh, it is meaningful to me to be asked to be able to spend some time with you today as we honor Johnny's memory. They have shared some thoughts that I would like to read on their behalf as we begin our time together. John Michael Hardwick, or Johnny, as known to his family, friends, and fans, was born in Houston, Texas, December 31st, 1958, and was preceded in death by his father, John Hardwick, and his brothers, Steve and Chuck. Growing up, Johnny played baseball and tennis as a youngster, and he loved to be in drama productions in high school. He graduated from Texas Tech University with a degree in journalism, and he worked as a stand-up comedian in clubs like the Valveda Room in Austin, and was the first comic ever on Jon Stewart's MTV show. King of the Hill co-creator Greg Daniels hired Johnny for a writing job after seeing him perform at the Improv in Los Angeles, and he went to work for him rather than taking another offer to serve as a regular on the MTV series Austin Stories. The role of Dale Gribble was going to be voiced originally by Dr. Daniel Stern, <laughs> Is this one on? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right. He was very proud of, uh, well, he was very proud of what we created and was looking forward to the
and then we'll enjoy those and then be followed in here in just a few minutes with some special eulogies remembering Johnny by some dear friends whom I'll introduce after the first song. Let's listen. beautiful song is aptly titled Be Still My Soul. There is something about being in the presence of friends that definitely brings that experience to our lives. God has a unique way of bringing the right people into our lives over the years that when we are with them, they give us a measure of peace and comfort and perspective. We are blessed today to have two such friends in Johnny's life to come and share personal thoughts and stories to help us remember and celebrate Johnny today. They are Scott St. Louis and Wade Mundinger, and I'm gonna invite Scott to come up first 
And then Wade, as soon as he's done, feel free to come up as well. So. Hey, you guys, I'm Scott St. Louis. You know, I was thinking about like what you left out of the eulogy is that Johnny kind of like earned his way into the position of Dale where he annoyed everybody in the writer's room using that I am Dale Gribble voice, I am Dale Gribble voice, right? Until finally they just said, go ahead. And they gave him $4,000 an episode to start with, you know, which is not a lot of money, especially out in LA. But you know, he was like the eccentric Mad Hatter. He was just this uh, obsessed with learning how to play different instruments. Really loved music. Loved music. And I just think about, uh, I think Dave, another comedian gave him that piano that was in his house. And the next thing you know, he was playing the piano. He's playing Elton John and he's playing, and he created that pocket sand video. And, and I used to always give him a little bit of heat, like, hey, dude, you need me to come over there and adjust the sound for you? And he's like, no, I think it's funny that it has, like, reverb, and he's playing it through, like, this Fender amp. It's just phenomenal. So I just, I typed up some notes on the plane ride in this morning, and, you know, I was not looking forward to this, because uh, he was my friend. You know, he was uh, one of my best friends, and, and we spent so much time together creating this show called Trailer Metal. And um, I met Johnny for the first time at Warner Brothers Studio through a friend named Joe Boucher, who was a producer on The King of the Hill. And when Johnny came in, just everything came together. And it was just, it was amazing to watch him work. And he was such a brilliant writer and just this super eccentric, eclectic individual that I just fell in love with him from the gate, you know. And his dog, Willie, which is like his sidekick, who, who I have now, uh, he's living comfortably, by the, way, by the way, on a five-acre ranch with five other dogs, and he's found his place. But, you know, the, the, uh, the, the King of the Hill reboot. So when Johnny came out to California, he stayed at my place. And he did four episodes while there for the new King of the Hill reboot. And he hadn't done the King of the Hill in many years, but once he got the script and he got into the studio and to see him come alive and to become Dale Gribble, because there was a part of him that actually was Dale Gribble. I think a lot, especially the family, probably knows that. So he, he just, he lit up. And I, I've seen a lot of voice actors work but I've never seen anybody work like him. I mean, it was just this phenomenal, brilliant, he could read a line without ever seeing it. He could give you four or five different takes of that line. And, it, and, and he did every single episode in about 30 minutes. So it took, what, well, it would take a normal voice actor to come in, you know, it could take him hours and hours and hours. Johnny could do it in like 30 minutes. It was just, it was such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so when he came out to California, he brought illegal fireworks to my house. And he was like, I really want your kids to like experience bottle rockets. Why well, live in a high fire climate, right? So I said, Johnny, we're going to have to wait because I don't want to burn California down. So one of these days soon, when the rain starts to come, we're going to light off those Roman candles and bottle rockets and firecrackers in a celebration of his life. And I, I want to leave you with, with one thing. Just let me get to it. Johnny told my kids, enjoy your time on this beautiful land of yours and don't take it for granted. And then he told my wife, who was looking at a meme that said, uh, trust no one, right? And Johnny went right up to her and he pulled up his arm with his Dale tattoo that says, trust no one. And he just looked at her and smiled, you know? So I would say, if Johnny was here today, he would say, enjoy this beautiful time and don't take it for granted, but trust no one. <laughs> Thanks.
Wally and I lived together back in 83 to 87 in Lower Greenville Avenue. We lived in a house we affectionately called the Fiasco on Velasco. <laughs> and we had a, we had a, quite a good time there. It was a 24 hour, seven day a week. I don't necessarily call it a party, but other people would. Now, people have asked me why I call him Wally. He worked at a place called Nick's Uptown, his live music venue. And uh, one of the managers stayed up all night watching uh, Leave it to Beaver. And he came in to work the next day and said, I've changed everybody's name. Mark, you're now the Beaver. John, you're Wally. You're Lumpy. You're Eddie Askell. Well, those nicknames for the other guys didn't really hold up. But Wally, he was that Wally. He was that big brother to you. He was the guy that you could go to, you could trust. He was just Wally. So we had Wade and Wally's fiasco on Velasco. And uh, I was tending bar at another live music venue and he started working at this place. He said, came home and said, man, they're teaching stand-up comedy and improv at this place that I'm working in. I've signed up for it. And man, I was trying to become the next Pablo Picasso painting, and Wally was trying to become that uh, Hunter S. Thompson kind of guy. So he was always sitting down writing or drawing, and I was always painting, and I was, he would come out, what do you think of this? Mm, pretty funny. What do you think of my painting? He goes, just keep painting. <laughs> he would never say that it was horrible, which it was, but just, just keep at it. So sure enough, uh, they, at the end of this little thing, you would get to get up on stage. So sure enough, he's working, and they said, we have one more comedian. John, come on up. And he gets out from behind the bar, and he throws his bar towel down, and he does his shtick. And it's his first time up there, and you know, he's... he's fidgeting all around. And, but you know the best part of that night was the front three tables were his family. They were all sitting there supporting him. And it was like, boom, this is awesome. Got back up there, got back to work. And uh, then he started doing, you know, the improv and meeting other comedians and doing this and doing that. He would always come up, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? So I'd go over there with him. Now, there are a bunch of bits that he did, but my favorite one was when he did Fred Zeppelin. He did this where he pulled out the cardigan sweater to do a Fred Rogers imitation, said, do you mind if I play a little guitar? And he had purchased this electric guitar that's about this big with an amp that's about that big that you could sit on an airplane bus or a bus seat and write music. And so he would just break into this, start playing Led Zeppelin, on a little guitar, we would have the lights come down and I would light up about eight cigarettes in my mouth and pull out two mag lights and get right in front of them and huff and puff. <laughs> so we had a light and smoke show. <laughs> <laughs> this is the start, okay? And he did all sorts of things. There was a thing from McDonald's had the talking uh, chicken nuggets and he bought a little tape recorded and recorded the thing. He had a conversation with the microphone with the bits. He just was always just coming up with something. And we just had a, he was a good guy. We, we took care of each other. And uh, through the years, he was doing this and doing that. And we just kept in touch. And uh, two months ago, Patty and I got married on the beach on Marco Island, Florida, which is way down there. And Wally showed up to our wedding. And it was like, man, this is, I mean, I was like a kid on Christmas morning when Patty said, he's in Gainesville. I'm like, okay, he's going to get here. We stood, we hung out till about one in the morning talking. I said, Wally, where are you staying? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> I was thinking about calling Tom. I said, man, it's one o'clock in the morning. Tom's been sleeping for four hours. He's just staying here. And so he and, he and Willie just hung out with us that whole weekend. And we got to see Tom and Doobie Conroy and uh, Uncle Duncan Wheeler and his wife Sheila. They all, we all knew each other from the Dallas days, and it was great. 
Now, if you can imagine, I'm standing on the beach. I got 80 people behind me, family, friends, looking at Reverend Daphne. The Gulf of Mexico is right there. And I'm like, and all of a sudden, guess who comes around the corner? And I was just, it, it, it was a perfect thing because it just, everything's okay in the world while I came to see me. I tell you what, those were four of the most fun years of my life and getting to know that guy. And uh, he just made me a better person. And I am grateful for that. Thank you, Wade, and thank you so much, Scott. Wow, there, I'm sure the stories could flow for hours. Uh, we are so grateful for what you shared with us today. You know, there's comfort in friendship and there's comfort in stories, and we also, on an occasion like this, are also looking for hope. And for that, we turn our sights upward to our Heavenly Father who loves us so much. Uh, we'd like to, you to, invite, to invite you to listen and reflect on this next song, aptly titled, Holy, Holy, Holy a special arrangement by our Stormbrier Orchestra. Uh, let's give it a listen.
So a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to sit with Kim and Wendy and just begin the process of planning this afternoon together. And uh, it's always a, a, a touchy moment because, again, there are so many wonderful memories that always bring a smile to our face. We remember the jokes and we remember the stories. Uh, at the same time, the loss and the lack of presence of our friends and loved ones, they make for a difficult and challenging conversation sometimes. Normally, this is not part of uh, what our responsibility is as a pastor, but if I could share a personal story, though I didn't know Johnny personally, I can tell you this, that when King of the Hill debuted in 1997, if I remember correctly, uh, there, was a, there were four college guys that were working their way in, down in South Texas through their degrees, uh, just trying to make it. And no matter how difficult or weird the work was, or the week was as well, on Sunday nights, we could all gather, because there were four guys that hung out on television too, in a backyard, in a back alley. And though they were making fun of this mythical place called Arlen, Texas, because uh, we were way down south. I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, literally minutes from the border. How could four Hispanic guys crowded around a small color television in an apartment relate to this? Well, it was this, that each one of those characters reflected a personality in our own group. There was the oddball one, there was the straight lace one, there was the one that was trying to figure it out still, and then there was Dale. He always made us laugh because Dale had a unique way of looking at the world. And it was such an incredible thing to realize, first, the connection, but second, to think, man, years ago, that was our little bubble of, of hope and encouragement. After a, a day of worship and looking up to God and an afternoon with family, connecting with people that we love, we could all come together as those four guys. And we had to end early because Star Trek was on at 1030, but that's a different, that's a different story. But it always brought a smile to our face, and it's always carried on in that whenever we share a text or a phone call or a voice message, uh, there's always a, a line or a quote that for years we had thrown around with each other from that show, not realizing that, that the beautiful and humble beginnings in the heart of this, of Johnny and how he brought that character to life. And so I'm grateful because his life impacted mine over 20 years ago, and I didn't even realize it, but it's always been a source of joy and hope, especially knowing that the government was watching us even when we were 17 and 18 and 19. <laughs> Kim and Wendy share that one of the passages that uh, had meant a lot in Scripture uh, comes from one that is well known to all of us. It's Psalm 23. And I'd like to read this to you all out of uh, traditional, the, the King James Version. It's always a beautiful version if you'll just listen with me. And then I'd love to share some thoughts with you as we begin to bring our time to a close. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, this beautiful psalm has comforted many at a time such as we're facing today. King David, the psalmist, credited with writing this, drew from his life experience as a young shepherd. Now, on the surface, this is a comforting and encouraging affirmation of God's care for his people, and we need that today. We need that in this season. But also as we dig just a little deeper, there are some truths that help us both today, but also in the days ahead. Through his favorite psalm, Johnny still cares and points our hearts towards hope today. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is a unique title given to God, that of shepherd. And it defines our relationship as human beings with him. Despite the fact that he is holy, despite the fact that he is above his creation, guess what? He's still our shepherd. Your God that knows you and created you, cares for you. It defines your relationship with him. Second, and I have lost my place here. I apologize. Oh, 
Here we go. In verses 2 and 3, it shows the uniqueness of how God cares for his people. Think of the terms rest, safety, wisdom, careful care. Many times we might feel like God is a separate, kind of watching from a distance type character, but there is a unique way in that God is involved in the everyday goings and comings of our lives. Because verse 4 and 5 acknowledge a significant reality of life and a big question that we might ask ourselves, especially when we face loss. Why is there evil? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why are our physical lives so many times filled with pain, suffering, and sickness? And it's interesting that the psalmist David answers by pointing us not to an explanation, but to a comforting reminder that as the shepherd cares for us, he meets our deepest needs. And lastly, in verse 6, it's a reminder that faith, faith gives us assurance, and assurance is what gives us confidence. The work and care of promise that is done by the shepherd we are the recipients of his care and grace. And all we're invited to do is not to prove our worth or not to prove our worthiness or our value. It's simply to look at the shepherd and follow the shepherd. Just like in cultivating deep friendships, you didn't have to prove it. You just had to show up and be there and enjoy each other. We are invited to know the shepherd because it's all about the shepherd. And today, as we come to you, Lord, even just to acknowledge your presence here, we come to you as sheep looking for our shepherd. We are heartbroken in our loss, but as we reflect, we can be reminded by some simple and profound truths. And with that, I would love to encourage you today. The first truth is this, that a broken world that we live in causes us to mourn the passing of those that we love. You know, the unique thing about comedians uh, is that they live lives that are a little bit different than those of us that wake up and do kind of a nine to five. Uh, first of all, they see life differently from those around them. They see the funny, they see the awkward, the sarcastic, the uniqueness of the inconsistent things in life, and the ridiculousness of the consistent things of life that never get questioned. I loved your Hunter Thompson reference. <laughs> what, what a great one to just the view askew of life. From government conspiracies to songs reimagined, Johnny had a unique way of seeing the world, and we, we miss that. Comedians also, they really do care about people's joy. They do it in their unique way, and granted it's on their own terms, like a quote like this. Are you seeing other exterminators? Is he licensed? Is he bonded? Is that what you want? Someone who's licensed and bonded? Because they're introverts sometimes, and the joy that they have has to come from deep places inside their heart. But again, the joy, laughter, and an askew view of life, then they bring those things to the surface. It brightens their day, and in doing so, brightens our hearts. In addition, comedians do that by taking things just a little further than the average person knows to take it. As one person described it to me, we like to push past the awkward. And boy, can it get awkward sometimes. But you know what? That's where the greatest stories come from, isn't it? Once Johnny got rolling, you were never quite sure when it would stop. And that's when you know you had the full Dale or the full Rusty experience. It just blew past what you think was going to happen. And lastly, sometimes to dig out the funny, people that choose a life of art, they have to live life a little harder and tougher and probably with more difficulty and challenges than everyone else. And there were seasons of Johnny's life that were hard for him to endure. But the love of others the love of his Savior, the love of his family, and his love for the joy his work brought to others were always a beacon of hope in those times. And this is the love that brings us together here. This love makes us feel the loss of our son, friend, brother, co-worker, and partner. The sadness at loss and the question we ask in light of suddenness or the sadness is real and not ignored or dismissed by our Creator. But again, these words from Psalm 23 are encouraging. Remember verse 1. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. A broken world causes us to mourn the passing of those, those we love. But mourning, or being willing to acknowledge that, connects us with each other and connects us with our loved one. And that's why we need each other, and that's why it's so wonderful that you are here today. This is why these moments together to remember are so important. And this is why in the days ahead, it's important to repeat what we're doing today. To remember, to tell stories, to reflect, to shed tears, to enjoy the laughter and the beauty that has been left behind. You will need each other. And I 
Thank you again for coming together in a difficult time. Through the challenges of travel to more and laugh and care for each other with Johnny's memory. And the next two verses, again, remind us of that. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When God creates a person or an opportunity to love and we show up and honor that, it brings comfort and joy to our soul. And lastly is this. Mourning gives us a pathway to hope. It is difficult to be sad on any day. It's difficult to be sad today to have to remember with the weight on our hearts and shoulders that we've lost a loved one and that we will have to continue on in life without their daily physical presence and love. Mourning can be difficult, but please know this, and please remember this. We do not ever have to hide our pain from God, because just as we never have to prove our worth to the shepherd, we just have to look to the shepherd. We never have to be inauthentic or pretend like we've got it figured out for God's love and acceptance. So be encouraged today. Morning gives us a pathway to hope. When he wrote Psalm 23, David shares with us, and I pray that it will give us a firm footing for the next part of our journey, that there is a growth process to understanding spirituality in God. It begins by seeing God as he's revealed himself to us. It grows in resting in the truth of who God is as he cares for us, and it ends in the redemptive grace that we have because of how God loves us. Remembering Johnny begins with love. Mourning Johnny requires truth, that we miss him, that we must figure out life now without him, but honoring Johnny ends with love. And this is how God loves Johnny, and this is how God loves all of you as well, with this thing called grace. It's an intersection of truth, meaning that we recognize our finiteness, weakness, wanderings. If that's him calling, we're in the middle of something, so yeah, I'm totally kidding. Wanderings and separation from God, but also love that he demonstrates love to us when we are precious, that we are, as a reminder, that we are a precious treasure to our creator. In fact, Romans 5.8 in scripture says, while we were still sinners, God demonstrates his love for us by sending his son. Let me put it in context, and I came across this rare reference in the show. There was always this one very interesting plot line that as 19-year-old freshmen and sophomores in college, we were still trying to figure out and reconcile. And it was the awkward love triangle between John Redcorn, Dale's wife Nancy, and Dale. Now, watch, we're going to tie this into Bible somehow real quick. But let me put it into context. This is what the sacrificial love looks like. And what a tremendous statement about loving despite present circumstances. In one episode, Dale is finally confronted about the reality of this awkward son that doesn't look like him and why he would choose to love him and care about him and just refer to him as son without a second thought. And here's what Dale says. She cheated? Hank, I, I knew about Nancy and John. I knew about them the day he was born. But every day since he was born, I've been taking my revenge. That boy, he loves me, Hank. He loves me. John Redcorn will never get it. He'll never hear his boy tell him that. Joseph will go to his grave loving me and never so much as looking in Redcorn's direction. His children, his grandchildren, they'll love me too, Hank. And they'll know Redcorn, they'll never know he even existed. That's revenge, Hank. Just like when the former Soviet Union resurrected Lenin to cause the housing crisis in America as revenge, right? <laughs> so, but you know, that's the beauty of, I think what, as I was prepping our time together, what finally revealed why every Sunday night, why quoting that back to each other, and why even now hearing the stories, Johnny was such a unique presence in our life. When you finally meet somebody that loves you unconditionally, is just willing to show up in your life and be who they are, that's something that endures through generations. And scripture, that love is called agape, and it's the way that God loves people. He just shows up whether we realize we need him or not. He sends his son to die on the cross for us, whether we realized we needed it or not. And just like John's favorite verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever would know, trust in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. What an amazing quote that in its own context points us towards the everlasting love of our heavenly father, even though Joseph was sired through aliens. 
you know, I never had the opportunity to personally visit with Johnny. I, I would have loved to have done that uh, about his relationship with God. But I was blessed to sit with Kim and Wendy to hear their hearts and their stories as we prepared for this time together. And I can certainly encourage you with two things as I close. First, remember this. As you sit there and as you go about the days and as we spend time together here in a reception afterwards, know that Johnny loved you all and his life made a significant impact on the world and those around him. And the second thing would be this. If Johnny could tell you one more thing today, he'd have, I'm certain, a unique comment for each of you, but it would also be this, that God loves you and that his desire would be for you to know the joy and hope that comes from God's grace through faith in Jesus. So again, today we mourn, but tomorrow and the days ahead, we will have hope because Johnny loves all of you and God as well loves all of you. And the same hope that God offered Johnny, he offers to you today. That Jesus died as a payment and relief for all the evil, pain, and suffering and loss that this world can bring. And that by trusting in him, we can experience the fullness of God's love for us. So thank you, Johnny, for reminding us of the love of the shepherd. In your life, we have glimpsed the Father's love for you and for us. And so we have, with that in mind, one last song to share with you, aptly titled, I'll share with you that as I come up afterwards to give us a final time of blessing, prayer, and an important announcement from the family. Thank you.
opening final song by Horatio Spafford entitled, It Is Well. That is our journey here as family and friends over the next few months together. So uh, I'd like to just dismiss this in a moment with a blessing and prayer over you. Thank you again for being present, both in, in body and in heart, and for family. Uh, we continue to lift you up in prayer, both as your church, but also as your community within that. We have a special surprise and blessing as well. Uh, Greg Daniels sent a beautiful DVD uh, that he had put together. And as we dismiss to our reception here in a few minutes, it'll be playing on the screens behind me. And if you have a few minutes, just take and watch. It's about 20 minutes long. So they put some serious effort into that. There are some beautiful deep cuts of past projects and conversations as laughs, as well as just special remember. Uh, memories of Johnny. So would you uh, join me in a word of prayer as we dismiss? After I pray, I'm going to just lead immediate family right over to our reception area, and then I'll dismiss you all. And as well, we'll have some food and refreshments, and the DeGenesis invites you to spend time with each other, spend time with them as we celebrate and honor Johnny together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are grateful that you have made us all in your own image giving us gifts and talents with which we get to serve you and our fellow man. We thank you for the life of Johnny and all the years we shared with him. We lift him to you today in honor of the good we saw in him and the love that we received from him. We entrust him now to your care and grace and the knowledge of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen. Again, I thank you for joining us today, and this concludes our formal time. We, again, invite you to join us over where Tom is standing, right there with the blue shirt, for a few minutes in reception. If you will just give me a moment to walk a family over there and spend one quiet word with them, and then we'll be dismissed. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>